So, weak convergence, total variation convergence, convergence in Wasser's dimetric, convergence in distribution, convergence in probability, convergence in law, convergence almost surely, convergence in LP. There are way too many types of convergence out there for probability measures and for random variables. How do we organize them? How do we make sense of them? Why do we need all of them? We're going to find out in today's lecture on probability and measure. The topic is convergence. But wait, there's more because before we're done with today's lecture, we're going to prove two amazing lemmas, two of my favorites, the Borel Cantelli lemmas. They're going to allow us to take something that converges in probability and make it converge almost surely, assuming it converges in probability, well, fast enough. What does that mean? Well, we're going to find out in today's lecture, and we're going to use it in the next lecture to prove the strong law of large numbers. Today, just state it and prove it, and stay tuned for that. Welcome back to another lecture of probability and measure. Today what we'll be talking about is convergence. Convergence in measure, convergence in probability, convergence of random variables, convergence almost surely. There are a lot of different ways that you can talk about things converging in the context of probability and measure. Um, we're going to try to hit some of the most important ones and, uh, and prove a couple interesting theorems about which ones are sort of more important than the others in the sense of which ones are stronger notions of convergence and which ones are weaker, um, including weak convergence, uh, which is its own thing as well. A lot of, if you want to learn more about this, there's a wonderful book um, called Convergence of Probability Measures by uh, Pat Billingsley. Um, and uh, it goes into a lot more detail than the things that we'll be talking about today. This would really just the most preliminary idea of what it means for convergence, but you can get some really cool um, topics. And convergence itself shows up all over mathematical analysis, of course, because typically, I mean, one of the first things you'll learn in an undergraduate course in real analysis is about sequences and what it means for a sequence of, say, real numbers to converge. Um, and can subsequences converge, you know? What happens if they're monotonic? What happens in different cases? And this idea of convergence just extends throughout so many areas of mathematical analysis, um, topology, um, here, um, probability theory. Um, so how do random, how do measures converge? How do random variables converge? Let's find out in today's lecture. All right, so the first thing we'll be talking about is actually convergence of measure, specifically weak convergence of measure. Um, we're going to start with just talking about how measures converge, and then we're going to move into a discussion on random variables. And before the end of this, we'll also prove the Borel Cantelli lemmas, two of my favorite little results because uh, they're super useful for proving, um, well, that things converge, um, specifically the law of large numbers, which will be the next lecture I do. Um, but for today, we'll start with the idea of weak convergence of measure. Okay, so then the question is, well, what in the world does it mean for a measure to converge? So in this lecture, we'll be talking about um, probability measures, but um, in some of these cases, we don't have to strictly restrict ourselves to probability measures, but that's where we're going to be living right now. So let omega f be a measurable space. Actually, yeah, we'll say just because we're going to put lots of measures on it. A measurable space. Um, and then what we're going to need is a sequence p i i from 1 to infinity. And this is going to be a sequence of probability measures of prob measures uh, such that pi is going to map from omega, or 
I guess it's a measure. <laughs> so it's going to map from F, the sigma field, into the reals, the positive reals, non-negative reals, I guess. Um, but what we're interested in, so then the question, the big question, is what does pi converge to p mean? Right? That's what we want to do. We want to have a sequence of probability measures and we want it to converge to a probability measure p. Um, but what in the world does that mean? How do we even, you know, what does it mean for a probability measure to converge to another one or a sequence of probability measures to converge to some p? So, um, for example, maybe we want pi of a to converge to p of a for all a in our sigma field f. I mean, that's kind of reasonable thing that we might want to show, right? A, a good property of convergence. This would be in some, I guess, a um, like a setwise convergence, right? The idea that for each set, for each, um, or almost like a pointwise convergence, for each set in our sigma field, um, that we get our measures converging um, in a because the idea is that when we apply these measures to a set A, now we just have a sequence of real numbers, right? So this is just going to be a sequence in R, and this is going to be in R. Um, so we can talk about this in the context of, say, a sequence of real numbers converging. Um, but then the question is, is this a strong enough or weak enough, or is this the right condition? Um, and it turns out that we're going to have a slightly different definition of what it means for weak convergence. So the point of this like intro is basically just to say that there's a lot of different notions of convergence and depending on the problem you have or the proof that you want to or the theorem you want to prove uh, you might need a different notion of convergence. But um, if we want to properly define weak convergence, what we need is we need something more than just a measure space. We need a metric space. Um, I guess in my example, we kind of have it because I was mapping into the real line. And on the real line, we just assume the usual um, metric. But um, in this case, we can do this in slightly more generality. So we're going to say let S be a metric space. Recall, right, a metric space basically just means I have a metric, which means I have a distance. So if I have two points, I can, in my space, I can identify how far apart they are. And that's good because we need a notion of how far apart things are if we want things to converge to each other, right? Um, so S is going to be a metric space and script s, um, hopefully that's distinguishable in my writing, um, be the Borel sigma field on s. So just to point out, um, right, a metric d can define open sets, sometimes called balls, right? If I have a point in my metric space and I have a radius r, now I can define a ball in my metric space. I can define an open ball around that point. So point x, radius r, I have a little open set. If I have all these open balls, I can now, um, I guess in that case, now we have a topology, right? We have a definition of a bunch of open sets. Um, and that can lead us to a Borel sigma field. So the point being is that we can, if you want, you can just think of S as being the real line and script S as being the Borel sets on the real line, but we can do this in a little bit more generality. Um, anyway, we didn't even get to the definition of what it means then. Um, we write PI double arrow p this is the notation for 
weak convergence if um, the integral of f d p i converges, right? Now we're just dealing with convergence of real numbers, right? A sequence of real numbers when we take an integral of f here. Um, and this is for all f, which are going to be, we're going to write it as in c b, I guess in this case I put r, well, oh, on s, yeah, of course. Um, which is, so what does that notation mean? That is, this is all continuous, that's the c. <laughs> The little b is for bounded, continuous, bounded functions from s into r. Yes. Yeah, so in a way, we have a kind of pointwise convergence, but now instead of applying our P to each of the sets A, we're applying it to bounded con any bounded continuous function. Um, and this is a very common, when you hear weak convergence in mathematics, typically what you're doing is you're um, converging in kind of like a pointwise sense um, for uh, for elements of the dual space. Now I haven't defined any of that in this course. Um, but um, for this, in this case, you can think of this in, a, in this weak convergence of measure as being I have to converge for every f that's bounded, continuous, real valued function. Right. Um, yeah, so as I noted, right, the um, weak convergence is going to be tied into the topology of S, which is generated by the metric. So a couple things to note, right? Weak convergence is, I don't want to say dependent, I guess it's connected or maybe I'll just say is dependent on the metric space S and the topology um, I guess that comes from the metric <laughs> or generated generated by the uh, metric We'll call it D, right? Just to be clear, right? D is a function that's going to take S cross S into R. It's going to, I guess, R plus because you typically right, don't have negative values for distances, um, right? So it's like saying the distance between point X and point Y is going to be something, right? That's our metric. And of course, metrics follow some very nice properties. Um, well, they're non-negative um, and triangle inequality. And if the distance between two points is zero, typically we would say that they're the same point. Um, otherwise, we end up with, I think, like a pseudo metric or a semi metric. I, there's too many prefixes. I can never remember which one is which one. But um, the point being is that, um, yeah, metrics can be used for identifying um, that two points are the same thing. Anyway, um, yeah, so there's a no notion of closeness, which is another thing we need to talk about. So um, if PI, I guess the sequence PI converges, converges, convergences, <laughs> converges, let's get the word right here. If the PI converge, if PI converges, then the idea is that PI is close in some sense to PI plus one. I mean, for I, for I, uh, 
large, whatever that means. Um, but we can make this a little bit more precise, right? Um, which is that, um, yeah, yep, that's right. <laughs> We'll say more precisely, uh, for a finite collection, for a finite collection of F1 through what notion I'm using Fn, which are going to be our bounded continuous real valued functions on S, um, then we define an epsilon neighborhood, which is just a little ball around my probability measure. I guess I say some any epsilon greater than zero um, to be epsilon neighborhood, sorry, of P. to be all Q probability measures such that um, the absolute value of F I D P minus F I D Q is less than epsilon. And this is for all I one to N. So what we're saying here is that we're in, in, in some sense, we're creating a, um, a notion of distances between measures, right? As if they were just say points in Euclidean space and I could, you know, use, what is it, Pythagorean theorem to figure out the distance between two points, right? Um, in this case, right, we have a P um, and then we are creating in some sense a ball around it. it. Might not look like a nice, you know, circle, but that's the best way I can think to draw it, right? And then out in this circle, there's gonna be all these Q measures and the point being is that all of these q probability measures are in some sense close to p um and that's what we mean right we're we're kind of introducing this idea that two measures can be close together um and this leads us into a theorem um, probably the most important theorem when it comes to weak convergence of measure something called the portmanteau theorem not sure why I guess portmanteau. Portmanteau is a word that means combination. It's it's a way to say it's a combination of multiple words to create a new word, kind of like um, synergy being synchronous energy, right? Or um, brunch being breakfast and lunch. So um, it's also just like a hodgepodge of stuff. So in this case, we're going to have a new theorem, which is the Port man toe. The portmanteau theorem. And the portmanteau theorem is going to give us a whole bunch of the following are equivalent <laughs> type statements. So let me write it down, then we'll talk about it, and then we'll prove most of it. <laughs> it's going to take a long time to prove the whole thing, so I'm just going to prove some of it. Um, for P and PI prob measures on a metric space, S script S. Um, so again, this is just like my omega F, but when I started this lecture, we just had omega F is a measurable space. Now we have specifically a metric space with S script S being a, a sigma field, but behind the scenes, there's a metric. <laughs> um, then, the following are equivalent tf ae dot 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 so now we're going to have five different ways to um well four different additional characterizations of of convergence maybe i should put a little bracket around here to indicate that i have a sequence i from one to infinity anyway um, the following are equivalent we have that pi converges weakly to p. 
Okay, we already talked about that in the definition above. It means it converges, the integrals converge for every bounded continuous function. But we can actually do better. Um, we can get that fi, not fi, sorry, f dpi is going to converge as a sequence of real numbers, right, to f dp. And this is for all bounded and not continuous, but uniformly continuous f. So we can go a little bit further. It's actually, um, well, the reverse uh, implication is, is certainly, well, the one is certainly true if we have convergence of for all bounded continuous functions, then we certainly have them for bounded uniformly continuous. We'll define this um, uniformly continuous when we get down there, but right, uniformly continuous is in a sense just saying that um, if we do that epsilon delta type notion of what it means to be continuous, then no matter where we are in the space, right, um, we don't need to change our epsilons and our deltas. Um, It'll, it'll, I think it'll make more sense when I um, actually do the proof. But we have that, and then we have the idea that the lim soup over i of p i of c is going to be less than or equal to p of c, um, and this is for all closed c, sets c. So for any closed set, the sequence of values I get, pi, the measure of c by pi, the limb soup, has to be less than or equal to the measure of c. Um, and then 4 is going to be kind of the flip of that. When I write this down, sometimes I find these things don't really, um, aren't really that like obvious as to like, what they mean or why they're useful. I think the proof will help a lot in this case. So um, <laughs> stick with me till we at least get into the proof. So this is not open, not open, see open U. So we have this lim -inf, um condition for open U. So for any open set, the lim -inf of PI of U has to be greater than or equal to P of U. Um, and then lastly, we have a limit condition, which looks a lot like how I started this lecture, um, the limit of pi of a should be p of a. So this is kind of like how I started it, but it's not for any a, it's um, for all a in my Borel sets on the metric space s, such that the probability of the boundary, which we write as like little delta, script delta a, or is equal to zero. So we almost, number five is almost how I started this lecture. Remember what I said at the beginning? I kind of said, well, one thing we'd kind of like is to have for every set in our sigma field, we kind of want the measure pi of a to converge to p of a. That, that seems reasonable. Um, and it turns out that this weak convergence is equivalent to something almost the same, which is that we have that convergence, but only for sets in our sigma field with zero boundary measure, or the boundary has measure zero. So then the question is, what in the world is the boundary? I put that in a footnote in my little course notes here. I mean, I can draw right a boundary, right? The boundary is going to be like the boundary of a set, but we can we can write that out more mathematically, which is that um dA, which is the boundary of A, is going to be the intersection of the closure of A and the closure of the complement of A. Remember, the closure is just taking the, well, there's lots of ways I guess you can define that. You can have a set and include all its limit points to get its closure. Um, or you can, I think, take the intersection of all closed sets that contain a, and that should also be the closure, I believe. Um, but in some sense, you can imagine that if I have, I mean, just imagine a circle, right? If I have a circle and I have its closure, I have a closed circle, now I complement it, now I have everything else, and then when I intersect 
the complement, the closure of the complement with the closure of the circle, all I get is the boundary of that circle. And the idea being that the boundary should have measure zero. Um, so if we're dealing with something like, well, I guess this has to apply. Oh, that's actually an interesting point. Yeah, no, it doesn't actually have to apply, I guess, for all pi. It would just have to apply for p. I'll have to double check that to make sure that's actually the right condition. But um, I guess it would be like you could kind of let the let any um, boundary, any any um, positive measure on like a on like a boundary set go to zero, and as i goes to infinity. Huh, I'll have to think about that. Anyway, um, yeah, let's prove this theorem. Like I said, the following are equivalent, which means that, right, we're going to try to prove that all of these are equivalent to each other. I'm not going to do the entire proof because it takes a while and it starts to get a little repetitive. But what we will do is we're going to prove that, well, one, one implies two, two implies three, and three implies one. So we're proving, like, I guess, what? 60% of the theorem. Uh, and then you would just need to prove that um, these first three conditions are equivalent to four and also equivalent to five, um, if and only if, right? Uh, so you can find this, like I said, you can find proofs of this in Billingsley's book. Um, you can find it, I think Dudley probably does. Like a lot of people prove this portmanteau theorem in different contexts. Um, but uh, we're going to do at least a good chunk of it right now. So proof. All right, well, let's do the easy one. One implies two, right? And when you're doing a proof like this, right, we want to make sure that everything is implying everything else. So it's kind of like a if and only if, but to the fifth degree, right? We need everything to imply everything else. Um, so if we can, we're first going to show that one implies two, which is basically like, well, if Convergence holds for all f in script C, like continuous bounded real, continuous bounded real valued functions, then it holds for f in, well, CB that are also uniformly continuous. So this one is like the the trivial one, right? Uniformly continuous, because of course, if we have a function that's, if it holds for all bounded continuous functions, then it certainly is going to hold for all bounded uniformly continuous functions, because uniform continuity is going to imply regular continuity. Um, so that's not very interesting. It's interesting that it's an if and only if, but we're not going to prove it. We're not going to prove that two implies one. We're going to imply. We're going to prove that two implies three, and then three implies one. So this is how we kind of circular prove that the first three conditions here are all equivalent. All right, so let's prove something a little bit more interesting now, which is that if we have convergent for all uniformly continuous or uniformly continuous bounded real valued functions, then we get this convergence of or this condition on the limb soup for all closed sets. So what do we do? Well, we start by saying for any closed C um, and epsilon greater than zero, There exists a delta such that we can define C delta. This is a notation that you'll often see, um, which is going to be we're going to take C and we're going to expand it by some value delta. So C sub delta is going to be all of the x, point x in my metric space S, such that the distance from x to c is less than delta. So this is now open. And just to draw a picture, right, if we have some set delta or some set c, which is my closed set, and then we have some delta, then what I'm doing is I'm creating an open set where I'm taking C and I'm expanding it 
in some sense by some delta. The distance between x and the set C can be defined as right the minimal distance from x to any point in C. So um, this green dotted one would be C delta, which is bigger than C. It's an open set that contains C. Um, anyway, the point is that there exists a delta such that this set, um, well, this is just a set such that um, the P, our probability measure of C delta is less than the probability measure of C plus epsilon. And we have and we have that C delta is going to decrease to C as delta goes to zero from the from the right, I guess it's as delta decreases, right? I guess we could write as delta, maybe it just makes more sense to write as delta decreases to zero. So again, what do we have here? Well, what we're saying is because of the setting that we're in, what we have is that we have a closed set, we have an open set that contains it, and as we shrink delta to zero, we're going to shrink in on the set C, and we can do this nice little trick where we here, and this looks a lot like what we did way back at the beginning when we looked at um, Carr Theodori's extension theorem, where it's like, okay, well, we have a soup or an inf, I can't remember which one, but we can kind of go to the other side of it, plus a little bit of epsilon, um, and then we're going to eventually take epsilon to zero, um, which is how these proofs usually go. But in this case, right, what we're saying is that, okay, C delta is going to be contain C, so the measure has to be bigger than C, but if we add a little epsilon to the measure of C, then we're suddenly bigger than um, C delta. So you can kind of imagine how this might work. Anyway, now, next, we define F to, well, we define a function f, which is going to equal 1 on c. And it's going to be 0, and it's going to equal 0 on s, the entire space, minus c delta, and uniformly continuous, and such that f is uniformly continuous. Okay, um, why can we do that? Well, this where you can look up um, something called Urson's lemma. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll write that in here just so that it's um, clear. C Urson's lemma, I'm pretty sure Dudley proves that in the beginning of his book, Real and Real Analysis and Probability, um, somewhere in like chapter one or two. Um, or you can also see, or there's a theorem uh, 1.2 in at least the really old version of Billingsley's um, Convergence of Probability Measure book. I'm not sure if there's like in a newer version of the book if it's still Theorem 1.2, but in my super old version that I got from a library when it was closing down at some point um, and still managed to hold on to it until now. Um, yeah, that one he proves in Theorem 1.2. But if we want to just imagine what this F might look like in one dimension, um, right, you can imagine this as I have a closed set C, and then I have some open C delta, and then I have a function, I'm running out of colors here, we'll do red, a function that's equal to one here, and as soon as we get outside of C delta, it's equal to zero. So it's zero here, it's one here. It's gonna look something like this, in if we were dealing with the real line, right, Fs, is the real line, then we would have a function that looks something like that. Um, 
So the claim is that even if we're in a metric space, we can construct a function of this form that's going to be uniformly continuous. Um, anyway, given that, we're almost done, because I think you can kind of imagine what we're doing here, right? This is going to approximate an indicator function. It's really close to the indicator function for the set C, right? The indicator function is going to be this guy, which is going to pop up here and then go over and then pop right down. The indicator function is not continuous, right? It it jumps, but uh, we have in some sense like a continuous analog of a indicator function, uniformly continuous, uniformly continuous. Anyway, um, then by two, which is by, if we're assuming, because remember in this part of the proof, we're assuming that we have convergence um, for all uniformly continuous bounded functions. And as a result, what we get is that the probability measure applied to C, the indicator function, is less than or equal to the integral of this function f d p i. Well, d, this function is going to converge by assumption, or this integral, sorry, is going to converge by assumption to the integral of f d p. And this is going to be less than or equal to the measure of I'm running. Ah, I wish I, oh, we'll do gray. The next indicator function, which is the indicator function for um, C delta. And this by construction is less than, well, I guess I said strictly less than, try to keep up with that. Um, of C plus epsilon. Um, and that's what we have thus, therefore, take the limb soup on each side, or on the left, right? And epsilon to zero. And we get our result, which is that the limb soup of PI of C has to be less than or equal to P of C for all closed sets C. There we go. So I think it's kind of neat because like when you first read the portmanteau lemma, you're like, well, what does it even mean? Like well, I have a limb soup is less than the, of PI is less than P. It's But this kind of gives you a visual idea of what's going on here. The idea that in some sense, we have these two different indicator functions. We have an indicator function for C, the closed set, C delta, the open delta expansion of the set C. Um, and we have a function that lies in between those two indicators that is uniformly continuous. Um, and that's what we're doing, right? We're using this little red uniformly continuous function here to kind of link from one to the other, and then using the property of the fact that we can get arbitrarily close um to see to kind of get there um anyway now what we'll do is we're going to do the a longer part of the proof which is we're going to use this condition number three this limb soup condition to prove condition number one so this one is going to be more interesting i think um so again we want to show that we want to use condition three to show that we get convergence for all F that are continuous and bounded and real valued. So the goal here is to show when you have a long proof, I always try to remind myself, what am I actually trying to do, right? So the goal here is to show that the limb soup of the integral of f d p i is less than or equal to the integral of f d p. And similarly for limb inf. <laughs> 
what I mean by that is that what we really want to do is we want to get the limb soup on one side, the limb inf on the other side, and then we can crush it together to show that we get convergence for all continuous bounded functions. Um, so we're going to kind of argue in two ways. We're going to do limb soup. Then I'm going to hand wave my way and say, flip everything and get the same result for limb inf. Uh, and then we get our convergence. Right, because if the limb soup converges to something and the limb inf converges to the exact same thing, then the limit exists and its limit is that thing. Right, um, so f is bounded by assumption. Therefore, we can shift and scale it. Um, so what that means is we can say without loss of generality w log, um, assume that f lies between 0 and 1. Right, f has bounded, so, and it's also, um, well, it's continuous, but it's bounded is the main thing. It's bounded so we could always divide and we can shift it up and down so that we have a function that lies strictly within this unit interval 0 to 1. Then we define nested closed sets. Um, cj and cj is going to be defined as the x in well s such that f of x is greater than j over n what are we doing here <laughs> what we're doing draw a picture because i like pictures right if we have 0 and if we have 1, then we know f has to lie within this whatever f looks like. I don't really care. Um, the point is it has to lie in here. Uh, so what we're doing is we're splitting this unit interval up into um, chunks of 1 over n. So if we have like a j over n just happens to be here, and then we're taking all the values of x such that f is greater than um, or e f of x is greater than or equal to j. So this would be, for example, this set would be c, j, I guess. So that's what we're doing. We're taking that vertical axis, if you like to think of that way, and we're cutting it into a bunch of pieces. Um, and this is, of course, uh, finite j from 0 up to n. So we cut it into pieces. And what do we get? Well, now we get some interesting relations, which you know you can stare at for a while to see if you believe that they're true. Um, we get that the sum of j minus from j from 1 to n of j minus 1 over n of p of c j minus 1 minus c j right these things are nested as as j gets bigger these sets get um, smaller right because you just have fewer points x that are going to get me a big value of f anyway the claim is that this should be less than or equal to the integral of f dp um, and on the other side yeah, I can squeeze it in here. On the other side, we get that this is j from 1 to n of j over n p c j minus 1 c j. Yeah, so what is going on here? Well, this gets back to this idea that... Um, when we do integrals in measure theory and like the Lebesgue sense, not necessarily Lebesgue measure, but just an integration in the, the sense of like the Lebesgue integral, then um, we're kind of doing the flip of the Riemann integral. Riemann integral says, take my um, 
take my function, put a bunch of rectangles underneath it, and add those up. Um, Lebeg is kind of the opposite in the sense that he says, okay, given a function, put a bunch of rectangles that are um, lying horizontal and add those up instead. And suddenly, you know, things just change a lot more than you would expect. So maybe I'll draw another picture just to try to make sure that we're all following what in the world this thing is. So maybe I'll draw my little parabola here as my function f. Um, and then if we're cutting this into pieces like this, of course the integral is just the area under this curve. Um, but on the left-hand side, what we're doing, well, on both sides, we're doing cj minus j, but then we're multiplying by a slightly different value. We're either multiplying by j over n or j over n. So in some sense, what we're doing is we're adding up the internal pieces Or we're adding up the, I guess I don't have a zero, so I kind of messed that up. That's okay. Um, well, zero, I guess, is going to be down here. So, or we're adding up the external rectangles. Hopefully that's not like horrendously terrible to look at. Something like that. Yeah, so, right, we get the, on the left-hand side, we're getting some internal approximation of our integral with these rectangles and on the and on the right hand side we're getting a a bigger one right and i'm going to stop coloring this all in in red before it makes it completely unintelligible but that's roughly what's going on here um anyway these things are nested so also the cj minus cj is going to e cj minus 1 minus the probability of cj. Again, because we have these nested sets, so we can do that. Um, and what that means is that, therefore, um, if we, well, if we just un, if we, if we undo the set subtraction, then what we end up with is 1 over n sum j from 1 to n of p c j. So this is the left-hand side. The middle is still just the integral as usual. Um, and the right-hand side is going to be an extra 1 over n plus 1 over n sum j from 1 to n of p c J. All right. So all we did there was apply this line to um, both sides and then add and subtract a bunch of J over N's from each other. Um, and we get this. So again, we're just kind of summing up. In some sense, we're kind of taking like a, a mean or an average of all the sets um, P or all the measures P, C, J uh, for J from 1 to N, which is kind of an interesting way to look at this as an integral. Um, anyway, um, yeah, now we're almost done because um, another therefore, if we apply the limb soup, well, what happens? Well, we have the limb soup of, in this case, we're applying the limb soup to F D P I. So we're switching now, we have P I is back just to be uh, clear. Um, and using the second half of this, um, the second half of this inequality that we did above, what we get is that this has to be less than or equal to 1 over n plus 1 over n sum j from 1 to n lim soup finite sum, everything's positive. We don't have to worry about any crazy like infinities minus infinities or anything. Um, Lim soup of pi and now cj. Um, and now we can use, remember what we were assuming, right? We were assuming condition three, which is uh, that inequality of the limb soups. So this is going to be less than or equal to 1 over n plus 1 over n sum j from 1 over n limb, not limb soup, 
we got rid of it. P of C, J. And now this is starting to look good um, because then we can use the first half, underlined it in gray, now we can use the first half of this above result and we get a one over N plus, in this case, I guess, yeah, the one over N P C J is gonna be upper bounded by the integral F D P. So that's looking pretty good because that means then take n to infinity and what have we got what we got is that the limb soup of the integral of f d p i is less than or equal to the integral of f d p so this is in some sense half of what we wanted to show um what we're going to do is we're going to kind of hand wave, well, not exactly, but what you'll see. Now, do the same thing, but for minus f, <laughs> replacing f. So what I mean is go back and do this exact same derivation, but with minus f. And if you do this with minus f, um, what you get is that um, the result of this is that the um, lim inf of the integral of f d p i is going to be greater than or equal to the integral of f d p. So if you kind of buy it, right, I just kind of hand waved that, but if you buy it that if I if I multiply f by minus 1 and then redo the same thing, I get a very similar bound, but in terms of the lim inf, then what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the lim inf bounds this thing from above, the lim soup bounds this thing from below, and um, therefore we get convergence for any f bounded and continuous. Cool. I'm going to say QED 60% um, because I'm not going to prove the other two. But like I said, if you really want to, you can find them in like Billingsley's book. You can find them in other books on probability. Um, I think the open set one isn't particularly, I forget. I think the open set one kind of follows from the closed set one and you just kind of flip open to closed through complements, but I have to double check the proof of that. Um, but yeah, you can find those. Um, but given the fact that I don't want this lecture to go on for like three hours, uh, I'm going to skip ahead because I still want to talk about convergence of um, random variables. Anyway, portmanteau theorem, super useful. Um, this lecture is still going to go on for like two hours. I just see it happening now because there's still a lot I want to cover. Um, so there's other ways that measures can converge. Before we get to random variables, let's just say there are other ways that measures can converge, right? Um, we have our weak convergence, which we just talked about, like ad nauseum, right? That not fi, pi converges to p uh, weakly. Um, but we can do some other things, right? Um, instead of considering f, this is right f that are continuous bounded real valued if you change where the f live you get different types of convergence which i think is kind of cool so you can also get something called convergence in the radon metric radon radon i assume it's radon not radon like the gas but i uh, don't know um the radon metric is basically like a uniform um not soup over i it's kind of like a uniform convergence uh in the sense that we have the soup over all f of this integral um is zero so or i have right arrow zero but oh i guess of course yeah as um i'll just change it like this <laughs> 
goes to zero as um, i goes to infinity. So this would be like a uniform over all possible. Um, oh, and this is all continuous functions. Oh, but they are bounded. Okay, yeah. All continuous f mapping s into minus one to one. Of course, if they're bounded functions, you can always rescale things. So um, for whatever reason, they were just defined that way. Um, so if we take all f measurable, um, f mapping s into minus 1, 1, then this is total variation. This is convergence and total variation. Um, so now we have all possible measurable functions rather than just continuous functions. And yeah, if we have Lipschitz functions, if f are Lipschitz, uh, with um, I think con with a constant a Lipschitz constant of one. If you don't know what Lipschitz is, it's basically like a way to control how fast a function can grow. Um, so Lipschitz one basically is like saying, well, you can't grow faster than like linear. Um, so you can't have like a quadratic function would not be Lipschitz one. It would well unless it's on bound unless it's unless it's on a compact set or something, then everything goes. Um, anyway, if you, if you have F that are Lipschitz, then this is called, this is convergence in the one Wasserstein net, uh, metric. And there's also the Wasserstein P metrics, which are actually quite interesting and useful. They show up in optimal transport theory. Um, but a lot of people are using them in machine learning now. Um, it's really, um, some really cool results, um, and I think they're also useful in like PDE theory. Wasserstein metrics are really cool to look at. Um, we're not going to look at them in this course, but maybe in some bonus material after this course is done, we can look at them. All right, so I'm like 50, 60 minutes into this lecture, uh, and we're only getting to uh, the, the second thing I wanted to talk about, um, but which is convergence of random variables. Um, of course, at this point, we've done all the hard, like the hardest proof or the longest proof, I should say, was um, uh, portmanteau. The rest of this is basically just state some convergence properties for random variables. Du Borel can't tell because I want to get those done before we do the law of large numbers because we're going to need them for the law of large numbers. Um, anyway, we did a lot of the hard work up above. So, But we also can talk about what it means for random variables to converge. So now we're going to have to define a couple things. Um, we're going to say let omega f mu be a probability space. If you read the old version of Billingsley's book, I don't know if the new version is any better. He uses like bold p and not bold p for two different um, probability measures, and it's just like the worst notation ever. I like the guy. Well, I like his books. Um, never met the guy, but um, I'm sure he was a nice guy. Anyway, um, yeah, that notation's terrible. Um, anyway, we have a probability space, and we need our metric space. B A metric space as above, right? Where script S or the Borel sets on the metric space. Um, then Remember what random variables are, right? In this course, we are dealing with random variables that are, as uh, someone told me once, not random and not variables. Um, they're measurable functions. So if we have x mapping from uh, omega into s, right, this is now a measurable function. Um, maybe I should say then a random variable defines a measure on 
I guess, script S. And what I mean is that we can define P, a probability measure, as follows, as mu of x inverse of a. This is for any a in S. So again, what are we doing here? Well, what we're doing is we have very abstract measure space, probability space omega. And then we have maybe slightly less abstract metric space, S. Um, and if we have a set in S that I want to measure, what I can do is I can map it back into X inverse, use X to um, map it back into omega. And then I can use mu to um, measure this thing. <laughs> so in a sense, it's like when you do this course, it's like, what is even a normal, like what a normal random variable mean? What's a bell curve anymore, right? It just like, it, it baffles the mind, right? Um, when you actually try to define it, because you think like, okay, I know what a normal distribution is. It's a bell curve, right? Most people are within, you know, plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean. But when you think about it like this, you're like, okay, so my random variable is actually now a function from a measure space into let's say s which could be the real line um, and i'm going to measure sets in s say the real line by mapping them back in s to my measure space and then applying mu now very often we can kind of just ignore omega f and mu in all of this but i'm trying to be very precise and keep it here so you know like where the probability measure is coming from um, though in practice, we almost can always just like ignore um, mu. Anyway, now we have to talk about convergence of random variables. So for a sequence xi of random variables, again, measurable functions, um, we say that xi converges d, this is in distribution if if what <laughs> if pi converges weakly to p where the pi and the p are being defined as up here. So convergence in distribution for random variables is weak convergence of measure in this setting. Um, of course, convergence in distribution in a, let's say, less intense measure theory context can be thought of as like convergence of a distribution function. So if you have a distribution function, like, um, well, like like our uh, whatever like our gaussian distribution function we can talk about converging convergence of those distribution functions but in this measure theoretic sense um this is the way we want to think about it oh and yeah just for notation's sake Uh, for notation, right, we're going to define the expected value of x to be the integral over omega of x omega d mu omega. But we can also think of this by change of variables as the integral over s of little x d p x. So this is what I mean by the distribution function here, right? And also what I mean by the fact that we can almost just ignore this. Because ultimately, all the action is happening in s, right? We don't really care too much about omega. It's sort of like, yeah, it's there. It's doing stuff. It's making everything rigorous. But all the action is happening in s. So in omega, it's very abstract. We have some sets and we have some function. In S, it's more clear. We have like a bell curve, for example. Um, 
And then we'll say also, if we say P I of A, what we're saying really is we're saying P I of X I in A. Um, or I guess what we're saying, well, I guess it's, yeah, the PI measure of the set, yeah, so. <laughs> There's a lot of shorthand, but then a lot of this is a bit, it can be a bit ambiguous if you're not careful with how you define everything. Um, and then I'll say note the portmanteau theorem from above. can be rewritten for random variables. So if you look up the portmanteau theorem in a textbook, you might see the form of it for convergence of random variables, not weak convergence of measures. So it's just something to be aware of, right? There's a little bit of a it, I mean, it, it's it's kind of the same. It is the same thing, but it's just good to be aware that if you if you do look it up in a textbook, you might find a version that's in terms of random variables and not in terms of measures themselves. Even though, again, same idea. Uh, well, random variables, right, as measurable functions, can converge in lots of other ways too. So now we're going to talk about a few other ways um, that they can converge, like convergence in probability. I'm pretty sure if you like look up some of these references on Wikipedia, there's like a convergence in measure and a convergence of measure, which are two different things. Like the terminology is just the worst. All right, so what do we write? Well, we write that xi converges p in probability to x. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means if for all epsilon greater than 0, um, the measure mu, we have to jump back into omega space here to make this a little bit more precise. The measure of the set of omega such that the distance, okay, we need our metric now. So see what's happening here, right? We need our measure space, omega, but then we need the metric in the space, then our metric space. The distance between xi omega and x omega is greater than epsilon. So what we're saying is all of the omega such that the distance between xi and x such that xi and x have a big bigger than epsilon distance from each other the measure of this set has to go to zero so what that means is that in some sense as i gets big the set of points where xi differs from x will tend to zero in uh, in measure I wonder if I can draw a picture of this. I love my pictures, so um, yeah. You know what's crazy, right? We have to think about where we're where we're actually working here, and that's what I mean. There's like so much mechanics behind the scenes. We have our omega space, and we have our s metric space, and what we're saying here is we're constructing. Um, we have like x i, well. <laughs> How in the world are we even going to do this, right? We're going to have to have like some omega here. And that omega is going to be mapped into two points. Um, X, I, omega. And it's going to be mapped into um, X, omega. And what we're saying is all of the all of the omega such that when they get mapped over to s their x and xi are far apart that set has to go to zero so we need this thing to kind of like go to measure uh is zero in the limit um 
yeah, it's kind of it takes a minute to kind of get your head around it. Um, anyway, um, in shorthand, we can write just the probability of the distance between xi and x being greater than epsilon um, goes to zero. So you can, again, you can kind of ignore what's happening with omega, but it is good to know that that's still there. Um, and the other thing to highlight is that convergence in probability is closely, closely related to D, the metric. Um, not all convergence methods are going to be so dependent on the metric that we're using, but in this case, convergence and probability is very dependent on the metric because um, that's going to define what it means for xi and x to be greater than epsilon apart from each other. All right, we're just going to keep crushing these. Next is convergence almost surely. This one we've seen before, as when I say two things are equal almost everywhere, it means that the only two places where they aren't equal is on a set of measure zero. Um, in this case, we're going to be talking about convergence almost surely, which we will sometimes write as convergence AS of xi to x. And this is if what? Um, if the mu measure of the omega in omega such that x oh i have this wrong in my notes <laughs> we'll get this i have this uh, i have to change that before i upload these um, typed notes because this is an error what i have here is that this thing is equal to zero but it's actually supposed to be equal to one the point is with probability one, we have that our random variable converges pointwise. So this is, in a sense, um, we'll say IE pointwise convergence, convergence um, almost everywhere or almost surely, depending on which language. If you're talking to a probabilist, they'll probably say almost surely. If we're talking in to an analyst, they might say almost everywhere. But what it means is that um, the measure, I guess we could also rewrite this slightly as the measure of the set where this fail, this convergence fails, where we don't have pointwise convergence. Um, is going to have measure zero, right? Mu is a probability measure in this case, so that's why we can write one and zero. Um, but you could also, if, if it wasn't a probability measure, you could still consider pointwise convergence almost everywhere using this um, second condition, he, the second way of writing it down here, because in that case, what we're saying is that um, the set of points where we don't converge has measure zero, and that can make sense even if we don't have a probability measure. Anyway, in this case, we don't actually talk about D, if you notice, like D didn't show up here. The metric didn't show up in this case. We're just talking about pointwise convergence of functions, um, Xi, whereas for probability, we're tightly linked into what the metric is. And similar to our, um, um, well, our, our weak convergence or our convergence and distribution um, is tied into the metric of the metric space. So again, little, little subtleties here to be aware of. Anyway, we have one more type of convergence to talk about for random variables, which is convergence in LP. So hopefully you watched the previous video I posted, which is on LP spaces. And now we can talk about what it means to converge in an LP sense. So again, we can write it like this, maybe LP X. I didn't have the LaTeX set up to do that, so I didn't type it in that way. But um, we can say that X converge, XI converges to X in LP for some P if the expectation 
of the distance. Okay, the metric is back again. D x i x to the pth power is the inter which is defined right just to be clear as the integral in this case it's going to be over omega of x i omega x omega um, to the pth power d mu omega if this thing goes to zero um, So again, we can think of um, in this case, right, um, this is just a function mapping points in omega into the positive or non-negative reals. Um, and what we're saying is that in the limiting sense, this function is the integral of this function is going to go to zero um, after taking it to the pth power. So the function itself, right, again, this there are little subtleties in here to be aware of. Um, but uh, in a slightly more digestible form, we could say if S, our metric space, is just the real line, then what we're really saying here is we're saying xi minus x to the pth power d mu goes to zero. So this would be a slightly nicer way to write it if we're dealing with the real line. Um, but we don't have to just have the real line, right? We can do this with a general metric space. So this is going to be kind of like convergence in the pth moment. Right, because what we're kind of saying here is that, well, we have convergence of this thing in the pth power. So this is going to be closely related to the idea of convergence of a moment um, in the context of like a probability distribution or a um, or in statistics. There's actually also connections here between the notion of convergence in LP and convergence in the Wasserstein P metric, which oh, I didn't write it down. If I if I recall correctly, it should be. Um, Wasserstein P is convergence, I think it's convergence in probability or convergence in distribution and convergence in pth moment. Um, but I would need to double check how that's characterized. Um, Cause I, it's so easy to get these things backwards, right? Cause there's so many, like this implies that, but I do have a couple implications that we're gonna talk about now before we look at Burrell Cantelli. I'm going to call this the hierarchy, the partial hierarchy, let's say, of convergence. Because some of these notions are stronger than others. Um, and this is just a short, non-exhaustive list of which implies which, which is uh, point number one, convergence almost surely implies convergence in probability. We can try to prove all these. I'm not going to do it now um, because we're running out of time. Um, well, I guess we're not really. The time is in some sense infinite, but uh, um, there's still more stuff I want to cover. Um, nevertheless, right? You can, you can try to show that these things are true. That convergence in probability implies convergence um, in distribution. You can show that um, convergence, well, for 1 less than or equal to q, strictly less than p, uh, less than or equal to infinity, you can show that um, convergence in LP implies convergence in LQ. Um, this one you can actually try to show using the inequalities from the previous section. So the last um, the last lecture when we talked about LP spaces, uh, we used some, well, we have some results that we'll be able to show this really fast. <laughs> Jensen, uh, if you want to try it. Anyway, um, furthermore, you can say that um, for any P, 
in one infinity, uh, we have convergence in L P implies convergence in probability. Again, go back to the previous lecture, see if you can show that yourself, try to use one of the results that might show you how things converge in probability. Um, you know, Markov, Chebyshev, maybe try it, see if it works. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, like I said, I'm not going to go through those in this lecture, but um, there's a lot of, um, oh yeah, that's, I had another interesting question to ponder, right? Which is that, we'll say, but convergence almost surely does not imply um, convergence in LP and vice versa, but maybe there are some extra conditions you could um, um, impose that would have one imply the other. And I would say, think back to when we talked about ways that integrals can converge, you know, monotone convergence, Fatu's lemma, dominated convergence. I just threw my pen, should still be working. Um, these are all um, things to consider when you want to show that maybe you can add extra conditions to get one to imply the other. Anyway, we're almost done for this lecture, um, but I really want to prove the Borel-Cantelli lemmas. Because again, they're super useful, and I'm going to need them for the next lecture, which is going to be on the strong, weak and strong, but mostly the strong law of large numbers, which actually takes a lot of effort to prove compared to the weak law, which is, again, an application of Chebyshev and you're done. <laughs> All right, so what do we need for this? Well, <laughs> once again, let omega f mu be a probability space. And we need a sequence, AI, I from 1 to infinity, um, AI in F, our sigma field. Um, then just to, I think we talked about what lim supes and lim imps mean in the context of sets, but uh, just to be clear, we can do it again, which is because we're going to need this like right away. So it's going to be good to make sure we remember this definition, right? Which is the lim soup of the sequence of AI can be written as the intersection I from one to infinity of the union J greater than I of A J. <laughs> make sure I get the things right here. And similarly, the lim inf of i over i of a i is going to be well the same thing but when we flip the order here so we have the union i from one to infinity the intersection j greater than i a j now there's ways that we can think about this in kind of a well english language or a set or a um in like a in an intuitive sense so sometimes some authors, this is like a little highlight, because some authors will just write things like this. So sometimes we say um, a i infinitely, infinitely often, or a i i o for the lim soup AI. So why why would an author write that? Um, well, that's because um, I'll say because uh, if there's an omega, remember the lim soup is just going to be a set in this case. So if we say that omega is in the lim soup of the AIs, then what are we saying? We're saying that we're saying because if this, then there exists an N um, in the natural numbers, 
Oh, no, not there exists. Sorry. For any... Wait, which way are we going here? For any n, there exists an n... Oh, yes. It's a little bit backwards from the usual way we write this. For all n in the natural numbers, there exists an n greater than n such that omega is in a n. Which basically means that no matter how big big n is, there's going to be another ai coming, an an, I guess, coming later that contains omega. So omega is going to keep coming back infinitely often as i goes to infinity. Um, and then something we say, sometimes I think I meant to write, sometimes. And then similarly, we also say um, AI eventually, eventually, uh, which I think some of the authors use as AI EV. Um, Where'd that go? Yeah, for lim inf. So then the question is, why would they choose the word eventually for this? Well, if we look at what the idea of a lim inf is saying, it's saying, I mean, in this inter a union of intersections, what it's saying is that um, this is because there exists an n in n such that for all n greater than or equal to n omega is in a n. So in this case, we're flipping the order of the for all and the exist. And what we're saying is that eventually you get to a number or a number n such that for every a n that comes after n, omega has to be in all of them. Um, so that's the difference. Infinitely often means that omega is going to keep coming back infinitely many times, but it doesn't have to be in all of them. Whereas eventually means that it's eventually going to be in every a n. So hopefully that's not too confusing. I don't necessarily like the way they, um, you know, that 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 terminology, but um, you you will probably see that in some books. So it's good to be aware of. Um, anyway, this leads us into the first and second Borel Cantelli lemmas, but I'm going to call them theorems because I really like these results. I had the you can find it in Feller's old book from like the seventies or I think I forget when Feller wrote his books in probability. I had it bookmarked for the longest time when I was trying to learn this stuff years ago, um, because whenever I wanted to try to show that something converged almost surely, I'm like ah Borel Cantelli. That's what we need. We just need to show that something converges quickly enough to converge almost surely and. I'm kind of just rambling right now, but this will make more sense in the next lecture I do on the law of large numbers, because what we'll basically do is show that it converges. We have the weak law, which is convergence in probability, and then we show that it converges fast enough in probability to converge almost surely. And by fast enough, we mean Borel-Cantelli. Anyway, Borel-Cantelli lemma number one says let AI, I from one to infinity, you know, be my sequence, right, with AI in the sigma field F. And then we say if the sum I from one to infinity of mu of AI is finite. So if we sum up the measures of all of these sets, then what do we get? We get that the measure of the lim soup of the AI is equal to zero. So if we use that in the context of our infinitely often, what we're basically saying is that the 
set of omega that occur infinitely often has zero probability. Um, so in some sense, I guess, yeah, these things aren't going to occur if we think of it in a probability sense with some, some event will happen. Um, in the limit, these events will not happen. Nothing, you know. <laughs> um, so let's prove that. Uh, the proofs of these are not too long, so <laughs> this video shouldn't go on for too much longer. Though I guess if you're watching it, you already know what the end timestamp is, so I don't need to tell you that. You already know it. I just don't know how long the video is going to last because I'm still talking. Um, fun. Anyway, um, so, so as the summation converges to a finite value, that's kind of a big thing, right? We have a sum of positive or sum of non-negative terms that converges um, to a finite value. What does that mean? Um, then the tail sum, which is i from, let's say, n to infinity of mu a i has to go to zero, and this is as n goes to infinity, right? So not only do the terms in the sum have to go to zero, but the sum, the tail sum, um, has to go to zero. And then, in some sense, that's it, right? Because then what we say is, therefore, mu of the limb soup of i, a i, um, is going to, using set theory notation, from above is going to be our intersection i from 1 to infinity union j greater than i of the a i. Now, okay, what can we do with this? Well, we can just throw away the intersection um, and make this bigger by monotonicity. So if we don't intersect, if we just fix any i, and we just union all the j greater than i, well, this is only going to get bigger in measure. Um, and by subadditivity, now we just have a summation j greater than i of mu of a i. And by this above condition here, right, what we're saying is that this thing is going to go to zero as i goes to infinity. And um, yeah, that's basically it, right? <laughs> Cool, QED, Borel-Cantelli lemma number one. Um, and then we have the second Borel-Cantelli lemma. This is the second Borel-Cantelli lemma. I think I got that right. Can yeah, double L for Cantelli. Cool, so this one, okay, this is gonna start very similar to the last one. We have our collection of sets, a i, i from one to infinity, um, but now we have an additional condition, be independent. So new condition compared to the first one, be independent. Um, and of course the ai are in our sigma so we now have an independent collection of sets remember that means that well if we take the probability measure of the intersection of any finite collection of them it becomes the product of the probability measures of each of them um, now then if the sum i from one to infinity of mu ai is infinity, if it diverges to infinity, then what we get is mu of the limb soup of i of a i is equal to one. So what does that mean? Well, that means that um, omega will occur infinitely often, or the omega that occur infinitely often have probability one which in some sense means like, I guess everything occurs infinitely often. Um, 
in the sense that um, the uh, measure of this set, is, this has to be one. So in some sense, it's going to be like, well, it's not all of omega, I guess, but it's enough of it to have measure one, right? You can always modify things on a set of measure zero. So right, let's prove it. The proof is slightly, slightly longer than the last one, but it's not that long. So first we have a little inequality that's very useful. Note that one minus T is less than or equal to E to the minus T. Okay. If you don't believe me, you can draw a picture of it, right? E to the minus T is going to look like this. And, um, T minus one or one minus T is going to just be a straight line. That's going to hit it at the origin and then go off like that. So this is my one minus T and this black line here is the E to the minus T. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's like, okay, sure. Yeah, of course. But, um, this is for all T and R or not T and N for all T and R. I'm still in the natural numbers. Um, so next, um, one can check that if the AI, <laughs> one can check means I'm not actually going to show you, but, um, if you're actually in my real class here in person, then we already did this, um, you know, as a part of an exercise and an assignment, but um, one can check that if the AIs are independent, then the collection of complements AIC are independent. You can try and do this yourself at home, right? Um, Independence means, again, any finite collection of the AIs, the measure of the intersection is the product of the measures. Um, so you can do that. And then in some sense, just try to apply the same thing to the complement. Um, and you're going to get a bunch of one minus P's everywhere and stuff. But I think it should work out. Um, anyway, if we believe that um, the complements are independent, then we'll say, therefore, for any i in the naturals and k greater than or equal to i, what we get is that the measure of the intersection j from i to k of a j complement by um, by independence is equal to the product j from i to k and by the fact that it's a bunch of complements of one minus mu a i no a j get my index correct and if we imply this um little goofy exponential inequality thing from above um this is going to allow us to push everything into an exponent, which is actually kind of neat because it means we can turn our product into a sum. It's always a good day when you can turn a product into a sum. A J. There we go. All right. So wh what do we do with this? Well, we're going to take K to infinity. So we take K to infinity. Um, and the right hand side goes to zero. That is this thing goes to zero, right? Because we know that this sum diverges. So if we take the thing in the exponent to, well, if the sum goes to infinity, then multiplying by minus one takes it to minus infinity and e to the minus infinity is zero because sure, right? <laughs> Convergence. Um, Therefore, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that mu of the intersection for j greater than i, right? We're taking k to infinity of a, not c, a j complement um, is going to equal zero. And this is for all i. Uh, 
and thus we can kind of finish it. Um, therefore, we get the measure of the limb soup of the AI is going to be mu of the intersection i from 1 to infinity of the union. Oh yeah, we're complement. I was going to say, I'm like, I don't want the intersection first. I want the intersection second, but we're going to complement it. Yeah. Otherwise, I was getting kind of scared. I'm like, did I make a mistake here? No, we want that. That's just by definition what we have. Um, but if we complement this whole thing and use the whole De Morgan's Law stuff, which I always get wrong if I'm not careful, um, the unions and the intersections swap and we get a complement. Uh, so we have the union i from 1 to infinity of not the union, the intersection j greater than i of a j, but now it's complemented. Um, and we know that this thing is going to be zero, which means this whole thing is going to just be one. The last thing's going to be zero, right? Because what we're saying is, well, the measure of all these, um, the measure of all these sets is just going to be zero. So if I union a whole bunch of measure zero sets together, I still get a set of measure zero, right? Um, I mean, I guess you can do like sub additivity or something to show that, of course. But um, yeah. Anyway, QED. Burrell can't tally number two proven. Right. So um, yeah, that's about everything I wanted to talk about in this video. Um, Burrell can't tally at first may seem a little opaque, right? And you look at it, you're like, okay, I like what what what's going on here, right? So the limb soup is one, or the limb soup is zero. Um, Super useful though, and we're gonna use this to prove the strong law of large numbers, but that will happen in the next video. So stay tuned for that one. See you there. Mm -hmm.